<laughs> oh my god! All right. So good evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to this very, very, very special edition of the conversation. My guest, well, okay, so let me just give you a couple of disclaimers. So it is oh. my effort tonight not to <laughs> talk to our guest as if he's family, because he is, because it's be a whole different conversation, and <laughs> we just can't do that tonight. Um, what we are going to focus on tonight is what has been happening, obviously, here in Mecklenburg County. We're going to talk about the real what's been happening back behind closed doors as far as just the people power and the energy to be able to get behind all of this. Um, what it's really been like to be in the on the front lines, literally on the front lines of of battling um, this epidemic on all social levels. Um, but then we're going to talk about the good news and what's going on here in the county, despite um, everything that we're having to deal with and the sacrifices that we have to make as a community. We're going to talk about the good things um, that we've both seen in terms of the community coming together to support each other and to help each other. So before we, of course, get into all of that good stuff, make sure if you haven't done so already, like, follow and subscribe at all things social media at The Conversation or at The Combo Pod Show. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course on YouTube. Um, we are now live tonight on our YouTube channel as well. So if you haven't subscribed, make sure that you go there. We're also live on The Conversation Facebook page. So I can see, um, we both can see the questions and comments on Facebook. So feel free to jump in to say hello, to um, leave us any of your questions and we'll be able to see them and hopefully address most, most of them because we have a lot of ground to cover. So again, welcome to the conversation where we are going to talk about it. So needless to say, um, our lives have been changed in a dramatic way in the last 45 days. And um, what has happened as, as far as Mecklenburg County is concerned and what has changed and, and how things are ebb, have ebbed and flowed really go down, go down to the people themselves, what people are dealing with, what people are experiencing in their own lives and how their own livelihoods are affected. I'm so excited about my guest tonight, y'all. We tried to do this a couple of weeks ago and it was just impossible. And not because we did not want to put this information out there. It's just that he wasn't getting any rest at all because of what was going on and how Mecklenburg County and the state was dealing with, with all of the things that were coming at us at a, at, 150 miles an hour. So our guest is Anthony Trotman, who is the assistant county manager. So the technical, the technical title is he is the assistant county manager. Let me make sure I say this right, because Consolidated Human Services, Human Services Agency Director for Mecklenburg County Government. So in layman's terms, that means he's the assistant county manager for health and human services. So that's everything. That covers from birth, birth certificates to death, death certificates, everything in between the health department, social services, even child support. All of that comes under the purview of what he manages. He manages over a three hundred million dollar annual budget and has oversight for over twenty seven hundred employees here in Mecklenburg County. And he is my cousin, one of them trop, no you know, you already know. So welcome to the show, Anthony Trotman. Hey, I love <laughs> you know, it. I love it. How are you doing tonight? How are you feeling? Let's start there. How are you feeling? Well, I feel good. I, okay. I feel good because one, you know, this weekend was um, Easter. Mm -hmm. And I got some rest. Um, we all took some time off. Although we were monitoring everything, we all took a couple of hours off just to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So mm -hmm. I'm really happy to be in a community that that believes right. and, and celebrates. And so I, I feel good. Um, I feel optimistic because I know we have some of the best minds working on this, uh, mm -hmm. both nationally and in our state and locally. Mm -hmm. So I feel good and I feel good to be in a generous community. So I feel good about that. I mean, there's a lot that we're going to talk about, but you know, I am optimistic. Very good. So as you all join in and okay, why are they tripping tonight? Now, now y'all already know that I have 
two cats and they just trying to jump in my lap. <laughs> it must be you because they must know it's you because they trying to say hello yeah. and everything. Anyway, yeah. um, so tell us, uh, so normally under a normal show circumstance, we would go a lot into your background and really tell your story in a way that is more comprehensive. Um, now you actually came here from the county manager's office um, in Franklin, Ohio, Franklin County, Ohio. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So give us a little um, bit about your background in terms of how you ended up in, in government and in city government in terms of the ma of a management role. Well, I started in government about 20 years ago. Um, I spent 10 years in the Air Force um, before uh -huh. all of that. And I was uh, in uh, Anchorage, Alaska and Omaha, Nebraska. So anybody from those two places that sees me, it's a shout out to you all. Um, I spent some time in Raleigh working in the healthcare industry. Then I went up to Ohio and was chief of staff of the state of Ohio Department of Job and Family Services, uh -huh. which was a $19 billion organization at the time. Uh -huh. um, then I was the county director. Then I was recruited here about five years ago. So um, I've been in health um, healthcare or human services for um, about 20 years now. No, it is 20 years. I started in um, uh, you know, 2000. Uh -huh. So it's been good. And so, um, and also a proud member, sir, of Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated. Right. Yes, right. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. You're more than welcome to throw up a hook. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Shout out to the bros out there doing wonderful yeah. things in the community. So, um, so you ended up, you ended up coming here to Charlotte. Now, was that a tough choice? No, no. I mean, I, I really love the folks in Columbus. Um, they're really good people, but, um, you know, being from the South, this was really just near and dear to my heart. I love Charlotte too. Uh -huh. It's a beautiful place with a lot of beautiful people and, and I feel at home. Um, so I love it. And so, okay. Can we tell the story? We probably should. Yeah, let's tell the story. Let's tell the story. <laughs> so you came here about five years ago. Yeah, yeah. And so about a year before you came here, you reached out to me on yeah. like, about a year. This is gonna sound so trifling, y'all. Yeah. Just, just bear with me. Okay, so about <laughs> so about yeah. a year before you came here, you reached yeah. out to me on LinkedIn. At the time, we didn't even know that we were family. Yeah. And so yeah. apparently my trifling, but which ne I never check LinkedIn. I check LinkedIn like three times a year, maybe, maybe. I just, I'm just, right. I just don't. Anyway, I didn't see the message at all. You thought, and correct me if I'm wrong, that I was just dissing you. Like how, what, what was going on there? No, I didn't think that at all. Um, I, had a, I had a friend that lived here at the time and he said, man, I think, you know, you have a family member down here. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about coming. And so I, I just reached out and, you know, just there's a whole bunch of traumas in the world. So, you know, you never know who is reaching out. So I didn't think anything of it until I heard you talking and the person was talking to you saying Trotman, Trotman, Trotman. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, then it just it went from there and it's just been all love since then. Oh, absolutely. No, but OK, yeah. we got to tell the whole story because that's only part of the story. So technically, <laughs> so we oh were. At, yeah, I, well, I'm going to tell it. No, I have no problem telling it. So uh, we were at the spot. Yeah. Shout out to Sports One. And yeah. um, it was quiet that night. And I don't even know who I was with. I promise. I don't know. We, I, She and I were sitting at the bar and no lie, y'all. He walked in. You know how you just kind of glance when somebody comes around the corner. So he walked in and legit, as soon as I saw him, the first, the very first thing I thought, I was like, dang, he remind me of a younger version of my daddy. And if you've right. seen any pictures of my father, like he is, he's a trauma, like for sure. Yeah. And so I just didn't think anything else of it. He sits down there um, because it's quiet. I'm down there, you know, cussing and carrying on, just being regular. Yolanda, because I was still on the bench at the time. And so, yeah. <laughs> so at some point he comes down and I don't, what did you say? I don't know what you said. I just know I panicked. What did you say? Do you remember? I just asked you your name. I said, is your name Yolanda Trotman? Yes. And I, said, 
I said, oh, snap, because <laughs> I panicked thinking, yeah. okay, so I've been down here cussing. Gee, <laughs> man, he's just like, this is not good. Cause I know I was loud, cause I didn't care. Cause you know that was that was that's a safe place for me. And so as soon as he said, I was like, Jesus. But then as soon as you said your name, I was like, Hey man, you family. Like we ain't have to go through like <laughs> anything <laughs> other than like, oh, you family. Have, have you seen my daddy? You definitely <laughs> are family. And then of course you told me you had reached out on LinkedIn. I was like, oh my bad. And you know yeah. it's just been it was just instant family yeah. ever since. Ever since, has it been five years? It'll be five years in uh, September. Yeah. Oh, that is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And when I say family, family. So let me put this caveat out here before we get to the serious part of the conversation. So this is my big cuz. <laughs> you know, and while I may say, hey, y'all, this is cuz, or I may introduce him as big cuz, not anyone on this planet is allowed to call him big cuz other than me. All right, little cousin. Now that we've established that, okay, let's get to the good stuff. All right. Mm -hmm. And so um, let's talk about when you first found out, because um, we know what the numbers are. We'll get to the numbers today, because we know where we are as far as the curve is, as the curve is concerned. But tell me about the first time that you heard about this and how you felt like, or you were told that it was going to affect Charlotte. Like, how did you feel? Well, I first heard about it when it was over in Wuhan, China, and mm -hmm. myself and the public health director, uh, Gibby Harris, talked about this because we were getting these uh, feeds mm -hmm. and said, well, we're monitoring it, we're monitoring it, and then it just continued to grow and grow and grow and grow. And matter of fact, we were, um, before we had our first case, uh, myself and, and my boss, uh, Dina DiOrio, and, and several others were in Washington, D.C., um, talking about this situation with the CDC and the federal government, including uh, President mm -hmm. Trump was at the meeting. Right. And so we were looking to um, cancel the trip because we were nervous about being prepared. Right. Um, then we came back early um, to really begin to plan and prepare. So it was like the first week of March. Mm -hmm. um, we began to put the plan in place and it just kept growing and growing and growing. As you know, uh, from a national standpoint, how fast this thing grew mm -hmm. and how fast it's grown it, it, even in our community. So, right. Um, so it was around the first week of March when we began to plan. And then from there, it's just we've been working nonstop uh, around the clock. OK, now, li literally, you mean around the clock. So how many days straight did you go, say, 12, 14 hour plus days? I don't know, 20, 25 days or so. Um, you know, we work in Saturdays, Sundays. Um, it's important for us to actually be committed. Um, and I, I think the entire team that I'm working with is fully committed uh, to this. And so it didn't really, it didn't matter. Um, but, you know, it got a little stressful at, at, at times because um, this is something that we've never dealt with before. Uh -huh. Um, and all of the best plans that you have uh, when you haven't dealt with something uh, of this magnitude, you know, it can get a bit stressful. Um, right. But we're tackling one issue at a time and um, trying to make the best decisions for our community. And um, I think I think we're we're still trying. Um, we're still learning and we're still growing as, as a nation, as a world. So, so, and so when you first, when you were first tracking it in China, did you feel like the, what did you think the best late plans were at that point? And, and to be clear for those of you who are watching, oh, your mama's watching, your mama's watching, mm -hmm. see you, bye, hey sis. Um, there's several mm -hmm. other people who've joined, hello to each of you, but um, your particular role as um, manager, you're managing the health department and you're managing social services and all of those other pieces that are that mm -hmm. most of us are affected by. So, you know, when yeah. you're dealing with the director of the health department and, and your team itself, at what point do you feel like for you personally that it really hit close to home as to the magnitude? Because everybody can say pandemic. Everybody can look at the numbers. Everybody can, 
you know, look at data, but that doesn't put a human face onto it. So when did it become personal for you that we had to do everything and to move quickly as much as we could to be able to um, lessen the impact here in Charlotte? Well, I would say when I, when, when I was in DC, um, the week before we uh, uh, executed our emergency plan and I heard from the CDC, the leadership from the CDC that said 80% of the country potentially would be uh, impacted by COVID. And wow. Yeah, yeah, like most people potentially will be uh, infected by this particular virus. And I had never heard a number like that. Um, and obviously, you know, from a data standpoint, everyone is kind of guessing, but then you begin to think about 80% of your own family. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you have to make it personal for yourself um, to then think about, okay, what do I need to do to protect uh, my family and my friends and so on and so forth. So uh, it got real, um, you know, again, when I heard that and it got really real when we began to talk about um, doing the um, stay at home order um, and all of the conversation behind the scenes before that was actually um, uh, executed and communicated. Um, it was real. So, and all the pushback on that too. So. And was the pushback more economic or would you think, I mean, and obviously not going into details as far as conversations, but do you think the pushback was more of the economic impact or perhaps in hindsight, maybe not understanding what the full totality of the impact was going to be on us if we didn't do that? I definitely think for some, it was the economic impact. I think for others, it was, you know, uh, people um, felt like we were violating their civil rights um, to be able to do some of the things that they just love to do. They want to go to a restaurant. They want to go to the movies. They want to go to the gym. They want to do all those things that they normally have done. Um, but all those things um, require, um, you know, physical contact and, um, you know, don't really push the, the whole theme of social distancing uh, that we're pushing. And we were very concerned about that because we made some of those decisions. It was before there was community spread. But we knew if we didn't do those things, the community spread would actually uh, go a lot, got fa a lot faster. And I think we've done some really good things in comparison to, you know, New York and, um, you know, some of the other communities that, you know, acted too late. And the interesting thing is we were supposed to be in New York City on March 13th. My daughter oh, was wow. um, she was running the, in the New Balance um, National Track Meet over that weekend. Uh, March 13th was the day, it was her birthday um, and she was excited about going to New York. And I was I was started to panic like we can't go to New York. Right. We can't go. We can't go. And I'm so happy um, that we made that decision and New Balance made the decision for us ultimately because they canceled the meet. Mm -hmm. But that was yeah. real when I wasn't going, but she was going. Um, and I was really concerned because young kids were saying this is about older people. Right. And 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 me as a young person, I can't be, um, you know, it's not going to bother me. And that's not the case. So, mm. yeah. So um, I, there's a couple of topics I want to get to in a bit. For those of you who are just joining us, um, and I say I see a bunch of y'all. Hey, Harry. Oh, gosh, quite a few people have joined. Um, if you have questions, drop your questions in the comments because we'll be able to see them as we're going along. Um, so let's talk about when you all made the first decision, when you made the decision to first do the stay at home order, um, because I know for us prior to that, um, they had already, they had just made the decision that courts were going to be down. Um, and I believe that order, because the stay at home order came out when March, it was like the following week, the March, what, what, I don't recall the date offhand. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Like the middle of March or so. And I um, remember that the courts had closed, or at least the announcement had been made on the 13th of March specifically, because I was where at the family dollar, what, <laughs> looking for toilet paper. <laughs> And I wasn't even trying to get toilet paper like everybody mm -hmm. else. I just ain't had no toilet paper. Like I had, I, it was before people were going buck booty wow over the toilet paper. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I say that jokingly, but at the time I remember, 
I mean, the rumor was already out that they were going to close courts, but, you know, I was like, okay, I get that. But I mean, we're only talking about a couple of weeks. And so it was 30 days. I know a lot of the attorneys were, were freaking out because we didn't know what that meant. None of us had ever been through anything like that, but you know, it made sense from a health standpoint. We just, I don't think a lot of us, me included, like we didn't get, well, does it doesn't need to be 30 days. Cause we didn't understand because we're still at that point at early March thinking it's not going to affect us. I mean, the memes are still circulating around. If you, um, if you had ginger ale as a kid, <laughs> Or right, you drink right, out of right. water hose, you good. Like you're not gonna get this corona, or you know whatever was out there. Or um, even more frighteningly, so we're gonna get to that. That if you were black, it's probably not going to affect you. Or if you're younger, it's not going to affect mm. you because at that point it wasn't affecting. Um, there were no real cases, or at least in the media, were not. Um, it wasn't affecting small children, and you weren't seeing people on the news that look like us that were being affected. And of course, that's changed dramatically since then. And we'll kind of talk about the racial. Um, disparities in just a second. But that being said, you know, after Charlotte did his stay at home, I don't think people understood it, understood the magnitude of it then. What kind of pushback were you getting from, from everyday citizens? Did you, did you find yourself having to explain yourself more often or did you find the opposite? Well, um, because we um, initiated the order or initiated the uh, state of emergency, the emergency operations center manages the communication. Mm -hmm. So within the emergency operations center, there's a joint uh, information center made up of the city and the county and other representatives from the hospital. Um, and they were getting bombarded with questions. And, and, and I personally was getting uh, questions from many of the nonprofits that we work with and just, you know, friends in the community. And, um, people were, most people were concerned generally about health. Um, and then some folks were concerned about, you know, the, the economic reality. And they were asking questions like, okay, well, am I exempt? Can we still do, you know, these various things and I don't want to call anybody out, but, um, we were getting, you know, lots of, um, concerns that I should be exempt because I do this or that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, from the emergency operations center, I mean, it was very clear that if we don't stand firm, um, you know, we will allow everyone to continue to do those things and we will really be behind from community spread. Mm -hmm. And even as I look at, um, the parks, um, we got great pushback from the parks and we want people to be outside. We want people to exercise and, you know, get fresh air, but we want them to do it at a distance, you know, other than, you know, family members and whatnot. Um, and from what we were seeing is people were not doing that. Right. Which is why we went further and we um, we closed the gates so that people couldn't um, drive to kind of limit, you know, the activity. And, you know, we, may have to continue to go it just depends on if people are adhering to it because we want to keep people safe mm -hmm. first and foremost. And so mm -hmm. I know even um, the, I remember seeing the article in the Charlotte observer where they drove around to the various parks and people were out playing basketball and volleyball and all that. And then um, once that was closed, there was a second article that I saw where even though, you know, you couldn't drive there, there was still a lot of traffic. Did that, does that trouble you? It does, because I think that people don't recognize who's asymptomatic. Explain and they think, what that means for, for somebody who doesn't know. That means that I'm not showing symptoms, but I actually do have the virus. OK. And thus having the virus, I can in infect somebody else um, without them even knowing it. Um, I could be a carrier. Um, and, you know, as we look at kids and so on and so forth, uh, many kids aren't showing uh, the effects of it, but they could be carriers. And Ooh, so say that again, say that again, because I think people need to understand that because you're not seeing that on television. You're not seeing any numbers that are affecting large amounts of kids. But I don't think people are understanding that even kids kids can be can still be asymptomatic. Absolutely, I think it, anybody can be asymptomatic, not just kids, um, but 
you know, I would make the assumption that everybody has it. Mm -hmm. um, and thus, which is why we really are pushing a social distancing piece, um, because you just don't know. I, um, earlier today, I saw a neighbor walk down the street and that neighbor um, and he and his wife had COVID-19. And he was walking down the street with his two kids and it really just hit home. Like, man, this person lives right across the street from me has uh, been uh, infected. And, um, but you don't, he didn't look like it mm -hmm. um, beyond the 14 days and so on and so forth. But he did not look like, he looked like just a, a regular person walking down the street. That's what COVID-19 looks like. Mm. It, you know, it's not all about people being on ventilators and seeing the death count every day. It is also about those regular people. And we are very concerned about folks adhering to our direction of social distancing. And so, OK, so you see your neighbor walking down the street who, you know, has had COVID-19. Yeah. What did you do? Did you freak out? Did you say, hey, man, get your butt back in the house? Like, what did you say? Well, you know, I saw him from the window. I, didn't, I wasn't outside. Um, but understanding the, um, you know, the time frame that it takes um, to get beyond it and, you know, really making sure that you don't have a temperature for, you know, the three consecutive days. And we have a strong public health team that our communicable disease team will call these individuals like on a daily basis or every other day to make sure um, that, you know, they're getting the care and taking the care that they need to um, get beyond this. You know, the, the, the big thing, 80% of the folks, you know, uh, get through this pretty well and they have mild symptoms. And so let's get to, I, I want to get to the, the testing, um, because I know that's a big question that a lot of people have in Mecklenburg County, like how real are our numbers versus, you know, our ability to test versus who's hospitalized versus who recovers. So um, I'm, I'm going to want you to explain that and break that down for us in just a second. But obviously we understand now if you didn't already know what it means to be asymptomatic, but um you know, there's so much conflicting information out there in terms of what's the symptom. It used to be coughing and sneezing and tightness of the chest. Then it was, well, it could be just a fever. It could be fatigue. So what, as we've learned more about this virus, what would you say the, are the main symptoms that a person should be looking for with the information that we have now? Well, one, we want everyone um, to stay at home, number one. Number two, if you feel like you're symptomatic, want you to call your primary care provider. And if you do not have one, we want you to call um, the health department. Okay. And I'm gonna make sure that you have all the, the phone numbers so you can post on your page okay. and share with the folks so that they'll know which numbers to call. And so the, the primary symptoms that we um, look at when um, a healthcare provider screens a person is do they have a fever? Do they have a cough? Is there a shortness of breath? And um, have they lost um, the taste and the smell of food? Uh, if you have all four of those very symptoms, um, you definitely should call your healthcare provider or call um, you know, the, the health department or call Atrium and Novant. And we're very lucky to have you know, two uh, good health partners in our community that have you know, uh, identified you know, certain issues and they're going to be placed in their mobile units uh, in the east side and the west side of our community uh, coming up this week. Oh, that's excellent. Now, I'm going to have you repeat again, what are the four things that they should be looking for? And then we're going to circle back because I just want to make sure because I'll post this later onto the page. But what are those four things? Again, you mentioned fever, loss of taste. And is it ta is it just taste? Taste and smell. Taste and smell. Um, Why is that? Because that wasn't that's that's fairly that's a fairly recent phenomenon. You weren't hearing about that initially as far as a symptom or was that something that was known, but just not publicized as much? That was something that was known and just not publicized. Um, as I talked about my neighbor earlier, they posted on their um, Facebook page all the symptoms that they were experiencing. And this was three or four weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And one of them was loss of taste and smell. 
Um, and this was uh, the, the the wife. The husband had it. He went he went overseas and came back and you know brought it home. And so uh, he was uh, quarantined in the house. Um, and the wife was doing everything that she could do to um, socially distance from him. Um, but it really was not enough. Um, when he first came home, um, she potentially got infected that way. And so a few days later, she lost, um, you know, the taste and smell of food. Uh, and that was one of her first symptoms. Okay. You hear I can't, I can't hear you. Did you lose us? Did we lose you on that end? Cause I can't hear you, Dill. Can you hear me? So, okay. You, Go back all four symptoms is, is, hey, are cause. items that we look at. Okay. Can you hear me cuz? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You can there? You hear me yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you fine. You froze up on me for a little bit. Can you hear okay. me now? Yeah. Okay, good. I can hear you just Okay. Yeah, sit up a little bit because I think it we I think we lost it. May are you on Wi Fi? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right, there we go. I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. Okay. So those are the four things that at least health um, healthcare providers are looking for before they would actually do testing. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. They and will so, ask you to call. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I mean, they'll ask you to call and I have some phone numbers I can say right now, but then again, I'll share those numbers with you. Okay. Um, for atrium is 704-468- 8888 and for Novant is 18779 Novant or 18779668268 8268 and for the public health department is 9803149400 Okay and so, so we will share those all right, so health department is 980-314-9400. That's correct. Okay, again, um, health department is 980-314-9400. Um, I want you to start with your primary care provider if you have one. If not, then step two is to contact the health department. For atrium, it's 704-468-8888. And for Novant, it's 1877-9 Novant, N O V A N T. Thank you for that. I'm going to post that um, as well. So you get through that and you have to go and get tested. Um, I think we've all heard a lot as far as the testing is concerned. For those of you who are just joining us, make sure that you, um, if you have additional questions, definitely make sure that you um, drop your comments and your questions so we can answer them. Now, okay, assuming that you have to get tested, are there, do we have mobile testing sites or, or drive up testing sites at this point? We do, um, and Nova and Atrium are doing that. Um, as I said earlier, um, they're going to um, utilize their mobile units, both of them, and um, they're going to be on the east side and the west side. And specifically, um, Novant is going to be at our uh, health department at 2845 Bayes Ford Road on the west side. And they're going to be on the east side at 5501 Executive Center Drive on the corner of Albemarle Road. And Atrium is going to be at their North Park uh, parking lot, which is 251 Eastway Drive. Um, and they're going to be on the west side at 1801 Oakland Avenue, which is First Baptist West. And so they're going to be screening and testing individuals at both of these locations. I would definitely call um, and or look at our website, uh, mecnc.gov, and you'll be able to see uh, when they're going to to be out there. So let me ask you this, because uh, I want to make sure I got them correct. So um, the health department and exec center drive, is that Atrium or is that Novant? That's Novant. OK. And then Atrium is east the Eastway Drive North Park area and at, at First Baptist West, which is on Oak Lawn Street. 
That's correct. Okay. All right. So I'll post that and give that information out again in a second. Now, is this now, do you have to make an appointment and what are the hours? Um, for atrium is 10 to four, um, on, on Tuesday at their uh, Eastway drive. And at First Baptist West, it is 10 to 4 on Thursday, April 16th. Um, I don't have the hours for Novant, but I mm -hmm. believe they're going to begin on Wednesday, and I'll, I'll get you that that information. Is that both locations or the health department at this at, point? At, at both locations. I'll, okay. I'll make sure that you, you have all of that. That's excellent. So let's let's just keep it real. Keep it real moment. So now what's going to happen and how do you think people are going to react? Because a lot of the numbers that we have, we uh, it's fair to say nationwide are based on the ability to test. Right. Like right. are our numbers real based on the amount of people that we're actually testing on a regular basis with Atrium and Novant being now? Oh, I'm sorry. Before I ask that question, is this the rapid test or is this the test that's going to take several days or a couple of days for it to come back? This is the test that it'll take. It'll take about one to two days to come back. Um, okay. So I'm, since everything started, testing has definitely improved. Um, and they will notify uh, the, the patient or the resident of the outcome of that test. Will they test you if you're asymptomatic or do you have to show symptoms? Um, after they screen you, um, they're going to they're going to make individual decisions on um, people. So I don't want to discourage anyone um, to say what they're not going to do. Okay. Um, I think it's really up to that provider based off of the um, assessment that they do. Okay. And so now that being said, um, let's move on to the racial disparities because um, it's kudos to Novant, kudos to Atrium for stepping up and going to the areas where it's needed the most, which is the east side and the west, and the west side. If we're going to be talking about what Charlotte looks like and dealing with the issue of racial disparities now, um, but nationally, obviously, we are looking at and we t I talked about this with my last guest, um, Brandon Risher, last week when we were talking about sociopolitics. But I want to get your take on this because. You know, one of the big concerns that I have um, and you working with larger metropolitan cities just in the whole infrastructure of it all is the issue what we're seeing in, in Chicago, where there's the huge, huge disparity, like 70 percent of the cases in Chicago are people of color. Um, like that's huge, um, especially in right. a larger metropolitan area. And that's not even with the uh, level of testing that luckily cities like Charlotte are getting ready to have with their healthcare partners. Now, and then their issue is, has been the dramatic, I think the even more dramatic issue has been what's happening in their jail system. As of last week, I haven't checked the numbers today, but certainly last week they had 250 inmates who had tested positive and 150 mm -hmm. um, officers or staff, which means those inmates, if they were just inmates there, they didn't get it. From, they had right. to get yeah. it from spread, from community spread, from people coming into the facility. Um, and of course, or people who are being arrested and coming into the facility. As of today, there's no known cases here in Mecklenburg County. We're very lucky. Um, Sheriff McFadden has made sure everyone, including him, um, gets checked for fevers and all that, um, what to check, do a temperature check rather, um, before they're mm -hmm. even allowed to begin their shift. And the, at least the two that were reported, according to the news, were caught before they actually um, began their shift. What's the big so let me, so let, before we get to on a micro level for, Char, for Charlotte, when you look at bigger cities like Chicago, what is your concern here as it relates to Charlotte to manage it so that we don't have numbers that look like Chicago? And do you think that's more so an issue of people not being able to social distance that, you know, is perhaps affecting people who are the essential workers? Like, what do you think um, from a public health perspective are some of the reasons why Chicago is seeing what they're seeing? Well, I mean, I think you spot on about, you know, in some of these uh, large cities where people aren't able to social social distance um, like they do in uh, smaller or medium uh, cities. Um, I think from a um, health disparities uh, standpoint, we've known this before COVID that, um, African American, you know, and Latino communities um, had higher uh, episodes of cardiovascular disease, uh, hypertension, diabetes, 
uh, poor eating habits, um, lack of access to um, fresh food and, and vegetables. We've known some of these things. And so as we look at, um, you know, the data as far as who's dying, because I think that's, you know, you have the cases and then you have the folks that are that are dying. Many of them, um, you know, had multiple issues um, that contributed to um, their death. And that's unfortunate, um, which is why here in our public health department, we have been uh, pushing um, with our with the, the faith community a program called Village Heartbeat, where we are um, decreasing, um, you know, uh, uh, health disparities by uh, promoting exercise, um, healthy eating. Um, we've taken, you know, we've influenced the churches to take the fried chicken and the sweet tea, you know, out of the basement of the church um, and have baked chicken and green beans and water. Um, and I think that is having an impact on some of those congregations because at the end of the year, every year, we have um, an event where we celebrate um, the loss of weight, the loss of BMI. Um, a lot of people don't have to uh, take high blood pressure medication. Um, some people, um, you know, have eliminated um, uh, the need for diabetic medication because of exercise and the eating habit changes and just knowing your numbers. And I think in some of these cities, people, um, they don't know, or they may not have access um, to uh, some of the same services um, that happen in, in other communities. Mm -hmm. And some of it, um, just to be frank, has is, is been done by uh, design. Our community has, um, you know, really accepted the responsibility of what systematic racism has done um, to our community in segregating um, you know, poor people in parts of the community and everybody else in another part. We we have accepted responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. And I think in some communities, you know, they're starting and beginning to have those conversations and accepting responsibility there too. So it is it is not surprising, um, you know, uh, some of the disparate numbers, um, but we know that COVID is not a African-American disease. It's not a white disease, Latino. It, it is not a rich disease. It's not a poor disease. It will attack anybody that gets in its way. Mm -hmm. so we have to respect it, which is why we push uh, social distancing. And so let's talk about a couple of the local community initiatives. Um, Annetta chimed in and said, shout out to Cheryl Emanuel for Village yeah. Harvey. When did that program start? Hey, Annetta, how you doing, girl? Yes, Cheryl is um, awesome. Um, she has, um, we are an award winning actually, uh, community county where we entered a national competition uh, led by Cheryl and the team. Um, and we, uh, won it at all levels. And mm -hmm. so from the Aetna foundation, we received a $500,000 check, uh, to, uh, expand the work that we're doing with village heartbeat. And that's because of Cheryl and those pastors. Um, and the entire team, and Novon is one of our partners, um, they do all of the um, clinical services. So as for the entire team, uh, we won mm. and we are proud, but we have not won everything that we've set out to do because we still have health disparities. Um, you know, we're working with the corner stores to add fresh fruit and vegetables. Uh, we're starting farmer's markets. We're doing a whole bunch of different things but we still have issues that we have to deal with. And so we're not surprised um, by, you know, the numbers, um, but we can't just accept it. Um, we have to do something about it. And I, and I respect the pastors and others that have challenged us to uh, do more in, in, in the African-American community and the Latino community. And we've had the county commissioners have um, requested that we do more. The county manager said we will do more. And so, you know, we really are trying um, to tackle the issue. And that's one thing about our community. We don't really duck issues. Um, you know, we accept responsibility and we try to do something about it. Um, but we have a long way to go um, to ensure that everyone has um, 
equal access um, to everything. And I know uh, Aneta and CBI, um, that's one of their main focuses is equity and equality, as well as one of our focuses in the county too. So I, I want to stay there for a second because you, you said it very eloquently when we, and you were talking about race and systemic racism and like none of this is new. The fact that right. the media is now, this is the talking point of the media in terms of now seeing talking heads talking about the racial disparities or, or why black people, specifically black and brown people are dying at a higher rate for COVID. But, you know, let's keep it real. And you did like, this is, a, this is more than just underlying uh, medical issues or medical conditions that are just affecting um, African-Americans. This is systemic racism. This is um, disparities in the healthcare system in general that disproportionately affect us uh, and not having the ability or knowing how to speak up for their own health or um, being put in situations where there's just, just uh, there's um, socioeconomic inequality, you know, it depends on which hospital you can get to. That shouldn't, which hospital you can get to should not depend on the level of care and concern and attention that you get. But in reality, that's what you're seeing in a lot of larger cities. And I think, you know, one thing that Brandon said on the show last week that I thought it was very true and compelling, and I don't know if you would agree with this or not, but, you know, historically, you know, doctors will look at a black patient versus a white patient with the same or similar issues or diseases and think that that black person can get past it or they're stronger or they can take the pain more. Or they can take medication mm -hmm. less to be able to address those issues because of their their biological makeup and may dismiss, be dismissive of symptoms um, because of the ability to go through it or we'll send them home for the emergency room faster versus admitting them to actually monitor them um, so mm -hmm. that this doesn't become an issue. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but you did bring up the fact that, you know, race is an issue um, in the healthcare system and that we have to really wrap our, our arms around it and not talk about it just for a media cycle. Cause that's what we're doing. We're talking about it for a media cycle. I'm pretty sure this is not going to be the forefront of the conversation in a couple of weeks. And I'm, I'm sad to say that, but I don't think that's going to necessarily be the case, but what do you think? Well, I, I hope that the conversation um, picks up steam. I mean, again, one of the, the goals of this board, um, our board of commissioners had uh, four priorities, and one of them was equity and inclusion. Um, and they, were, they uh, lifted up race and racism as one of the main issues in our community. And we created a, an equity and inclusion um, position within the county, two positions to actually lead that effort. CBI has been working on that for years. The city has been working on that. Um, and now the entire community needs to work on that. One of the issues that we have is we don't have enough access to um, charity care. Um, C.W. Williams is, you know, been here for a long time and they're doing some really good work. Um, but we only have one C.W. Williams. We have two other um, free clinics and they're called federal qualified health centers. And for a community of our size, we need about 10, 10 to 12 of them and not just three. Um, we need to provide better access to health care um, in our community. I know that's a discussion nationally and on the state level, um, but it is an issue uh, when you're not getting um, the level of attention that you need especially as we talk about black folks starting um, on the one yard line and everyone else started on the 50 yard line. Mm. You know, we have to put more effort and attention and, and funding uh, in the community. And, you know, that's one of the things, you know, I, I talked about earlier that I'm proud of. I'm proud that, you know, we have a diverse community that recognizes it. We just have to execute on it. We got to get it done. And, you know, I don't know, COVID-19 will never go away. We won't see it in a cure, but it won't go away. We, this conversation doesn't need to go away neither. And so when, um, when you're talking about and when the county is talking about the, the racial disparities and some of the things, one of the things that you mentioned was um, some of the smaller corner stores adding fresh food, um, 
to the extent that they can to be able to eliminate or at least start to deal with the issue of food deserts because that's that's a problem nationwide in terms of being able to get access to healthy food options that are that are reasonable um, in areas mm-hmm. that are served. So other than that, are there any other plans that the county has to be able to address that? Because, you know, food is life. We know that. Right. And, um, right. You know, addresses issues, can help issues um, and can help um, avoid health issues. So what are the things, some of the things that the county is considering beyond that to um, address the issue of food deserts? Well, it's interesting you bring that up. Uh, the commissioners um, challenged us. They challenged the manager and myself and others to, um, you know, develop a plan um, to add, you know, various grocery stores on the west side and and eventually in the east side and other places. Because if you look at the west side, there is uh, limited access to grocery stores, and you have the one on on the Walmart on on Wilkerson. I believe, but I mean, that's, that's it. And so um, as we were beginning to have conversations about it, COVID hit us Mm -hmm. and it changed um, everything about what we were working on on a day-to-day basis. And we're going to have to get back to it. Um, But because the challenge has not um, ended, um, Commissioner um, Leak um, was you know, led the charge and all the commissioners uh, supported the charge that she led uh, for the manager to come back with the plan. It's just all of our effort and attention went to COVID and thank God it it, it did, but we're, we're going to get back to um, the point to figure it out. And other, we've been studying other communities and uh, we've looked at a few proposals the issue is government does not run b- private business and the grocery stores are private businesses and they want to make a profit. Um, and so the question is, what role does government play uh, with business? And that's that's been a challenge for us. Um, that's been part of our conversation. We haven't totally figured it out yet, um, but the challenge has not um, ended by the commissioners. Um, and or the manager. So we're going to figure this out because we know that, you know, just working with corner stores and doing farmer's markets is is not enough. Absolutely. Um, So, okay, you're going to enjoy this because I don't know if you can see it on your end. Um, Dr. Rigsby said, let the record show that you all are doing an amazing job and that you... for your employees. Um, shout out to Dina DiOrio, um, um, the county manager, as far as leading the charge. Um, Trinavia, thank you for posting. She posted the study that you were referencing. Um, it's actually in the okay. comments as well. So um, we'll be able to share that at the end. Okay, so I'm gonna go back real quick before we go on and tackle a couple issues with small businesses and some of the good news, because we need to get to the good news. Oh. If you're just joining, yeah. um, great news. And I don't even know if I didn't see this on the news tonight, um, but this is fantastic news that there are mobile units that are going to be put in place by both Novant and Atrium. Um, testing is free and it will be at the um, at the following locations. And I will post this in the comments and I'll um, post it to um, all three pages and on the YouTube comments. But. Novant will be on the west side at the health department. If you don't know where that's located, that's 2845 Beatty's Ford Road. Um, They will also be um, at 5501 Executive Center Drive. That's the corner of um, Albemarle Road and Executive Center Drive on the east side. Um, Tentatively Wednesday, but we're not sure about that. You're going to get back to us and let us know when that is and the times. Um, Atrium will be at North Park which is at 251 Eastway Drive on Tuesday, tomorrow, um, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And on Thursday, there will be 1801 Oak Lawn Avenue. That's at First Baptist West on Thursday. That's this Thursday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it's like you said earlier, and certainly not discouraging people from coming if they're not outwardly showing symptoms or if they're asymptomatic because they will go through their screening process. Um, And again, if you have... Um, do not have a primary care physician. You can always contact the health department if you are experiencing um, symptoms. So don't let the fact that you may not have health insurance 
deter you or if you or someone you know is having symptoms of COVID. I can't stress that enough because oftentimes and sometimes in our communities, you think you can just, oh, it'll be okay, or it's just a cough, or it's just a fever, or it's something else. And it really could be something that's more serious. But on the flip side, don't freak out <laughs> you cough and you like, now nah, I got the Rona. It don't, <laughs> we don't want you to go to the other extreme either. I ain't gonna lie, I did that last week because I was like, sorry. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Hot flash. I hope it's not the Rona. Anyway, <laughs> um, seriousness, like, please, please, please take advantage of these because Charlotte is very lucky to have two major health care providers in the same city who are really stepping up. Um, and I think what's going to, and we know what's going to happen. The numbers are going to change. So what we have to also be realistic is when those numbers change in Mecklenburg County and you see the numbers tick up because we're testing more people, that should hopefully not just I don't, we don't want people to panic. I would think that would be your message. Don't panic, but also right. be vigilant about wearing your mask and social distancing and yourself in a position where you're not exposing yourself to unnecessary risk. Right, right. That's, so, that's a really good point. Um, is there anything that you wanted to add on as far as that it goes, as far as the mobile testing? No, I think that's, I think you've uh, summarized it very well. So, and so um, while we're on that topic for just a second, um, now obviously Mecklenburg County leads the number leads the number of um, cases, but what we're seeing um, in in all counties is what are we doing to address the numbers that we're seeing these explosions in nursing homes and re rehabilitative centers? How are we addressing that in Charlotte so we're not like some of these? counties where they're seeing 30, 40, 50 cases in a cluster in a nursing home or rehabilitation facility. How are we addressing that here in Plumberg County? Yeah, when we uh, first um, started to plan, um, we identified the nursing homes as one of our primary um, partners, mm -hmm. as well as our, our child, child care providers, our, our school providers. Um, as well as obviously healthcare and our shelter uh, providers, any place that there's more congregate settings. Um, and we educated them early on um, to um, really implement social distancing within those nursing homes and limit the amount of interaction that they had with the general public going in and out of those uh, facilities. And I believe that they, di they did that. Um, you know, I'm not you know, totally um, 100 percent sure of everything that they're doing, um, but they were educated before we had the first case on what to do in our public health department, um, which inspects them. One of the areas in public health is environmental health, and that's one of the um, areas that we inspect along with uh, restaurants and child care providers, um, et cetera. Um, so we've educated them early on um, on what to do. And so, I mean, you haven't really seen large spikes uh, there because I believe they know what to do and they know who to contact. Um, but you just you, you, you never know. Um, you just never know. And so what about um, with our homeless neighbors um, as far as how are we addressing that? Because I, I don't need to tell you and hopefully anybody watching that. Obviously, we have a major issue in affordable housing and um, just in general, but more specifically in the age of COVID, how are we helping our, our neighbors who don't have homes to keep this from spreading? And then of course, mm -hmm. being a hot spot at the, the men's shelter, the, you know, the, the domestic violence shelter um, and some of those other places. How are we addressing those issues within the county itself? Well, we have leased five hotels um, to address those issues. Um, two of the hotels are for social um, uh, distancing of the homeless shelters. And so uh, when we initially reached out to all of our shelter providers, we asked them what they needed. And because our shelters are, are somewhat crowded, they said they needed to um, um, provide social distancing and remove some of those folks out of the shelters. Okay. So, they they told us how many hotel rooms they needed and then we went out and found hotels and leased those hotels we also leased two additional hotels for isolation and quarantine 
And so uh, if a person doesn't have a place to go, but they need to be quarantined for 14 days, or if they're positive and they need to be isolated for 14 days, we have two hotels um, to place those individuals in. Um, we also have a hotel for first responders. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. If, now, if why they, doesn't this information get... Okay, I'm sorry. I I mean, come on now. This, this is absolutely information that people are, do not know, but I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I mean, you know, we're not advertising those locations um, because we don't want the media or anyone to go there and, you know, make make it a, a bigger issue than what the individuals already are dealing with. Right. So, um, but we've, we've done a lot and we're doing more. Um, we went out and uh, purchased um, quarter jobs and hand washing stations um, for those folks that are still uh, homeless. Uh, we've worked with the hotels and motels, working with our court system. They've issued an order to for no evictions of of hotels or motels because some people um, live at a motel or hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, that's their primary residence. And so we worked initially with Crisis Assistance Ministry um, to contact anyone that potentially could be evicted. We worked with legal aid to ensure that all those individuals knew their rights. Uh, so we've done uh, quite a bit. Um, the city uh, is meeting tonight. And I know that they're, they're going to be voting on a package to help, you know, some more medically fragile individuals to be housed as well. But, you know, your point when you started was we have an affordable housing issue here. We do. Um, beyond this this crisis, um, you know, we still will have a shortage of affordable housing. And so I know that we've been talking about it for some time and we're building and rehabbing and all those, those, those good things to keep people in place, um, but we need to do more. And, and we continue to have those conversations with our city partners and um, the Foundation of the Carolinas who raised over $50 million um, to build affordable housing units. So, Excellent. Yeah, yeah. So what about, um, now I don't know if this is, this is within your purview or not, but you, perhaps there's information that we can get out there. Um, are we going to get, what's the status of public transportation as far as light rail and buses? Um, are there, are there an, in, is there an increase of free options um, or what's the status of that? Or if, if you can speak to that. It's free. Okay. <laughs> That's the <a> status. <laughs> light rail too, or just the buses? Yeah. Uh, light, light rail and buses. The city uh, stepped up uh, along with um, our cats and, and made a decision um, because for the most part, if you are not staying at home, you know, we uh, expect you to be going to your doctor or to your job um, or you're a first responder getting to um, your job. And so for the most part, we, ridership is, is really down now. Um, and those people that are riding, um, we expect, you know, for them to be going to a place and staying at home or staying wherever they stay. Okay. Very good. And so let's talk good news. Let's talk some good news. Now the city, um, there was a lot of, um, press around, um, private donors in the city. I think now the number is over 3 million. I honestly don't know the number, um, in terms of funds to help people, this is probably about two weeks ago. Um, tell mm. me um, in terms of what you know as far as distributing that, because part of what what you what your what your division deals with is, of course, social services and all of that. So is, is that have you seen different reallocations for social service um, funds and all that to help the need that we're seeing with, of course, the rise in unemployment claims? and people who are finding themselves in positions they may have never been in before. How, how are we addressing that from a financial standpoint um, to address that influx that we're seeing around in unemployment because of this? Well, unemployment is a, a real issue. Our systems in these various states were not designed to handle, you know, millions of phone calls, unfortunately. And so it may take some time to get through that process. We've requested data for Mecklenburg County and we still haven't received it from the state. Um, but, you know, they are processing uh, those uh, claims. And with the CARES Act, 
um, it extended the amount of weeks that a person can receive unemployment benefits. Um, so I believe that that's working. As far as some of the social services uh, funds um, for food assistance, um, there was a federal waiver granted to our, our state where individuals can receive the max amount of food assistance now. And I believe for a family of three is, is over uh, $500 per month. Mm -hmm. And for a single individual is close to $200 uh, per month. And um, some single individuals were receiving like $20 or $30. Wow. Um, it just depends on their eligibility. And some uh, family of three were receiving less than, you know, $150 or so. So um, we are, we've definitely expanded that benefit. Um, we've made it easier to access Medicaid uh, for the healthcare benefit uh, for those individuals that uh, lost their jobs and lost their access to health care for those families and those disabled individuals. Um, we've made it easier. You, individuals can apply online or over the phone. And we're processing those applications fairly fast. We're, we're actually caught up here in Mecklenburg County in processing applications. I know the unemployment system is has a backlog, but we don't have a backlog here in Mecklenburg County. Um, what's the website? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but what's the website if someone needs to, finds himself needing to apply for either? Uh, MacNC.gov. Okay. And and for um, and the phone number is 704-336-3000. Okay. Again, that's 704-336-3000, and that's MEC, M E C K N C dot gov. If someone finds yeah. themselves or someone they know finds them themselves in need of assistance and that they are can now apply for much, much more that was available to them before. Now, is this a, a permanent change or is this a change just um, for the time where we are such a time as this, if you will? It's just such a time as this. Um, okay. This is um, and you have to um, request a federal approval for a waiver to expand it. And so this is this is temporary. Okay. All right. So good news. What's the best thing that you've heard in wake of all of this that's going on? Give us some good news. What's going on? What can we be what can we be optimistic about in all of this? Well, good news for me is, you know, having friends that have um, having a friend that was on a ventilator for two weeks um, and is off the ventilator and is healthy. Amen to that. Having, um, you know, um, uh, other friends that were really ill um, that are now healthy and are able to take care of their, their children. Um, that's good news uh, to me. Um, the small business loans that are available through the county and will, will be voted on, uh, should have been voted on by the city tonight, is, is also um, good news. And that information is on mecnc.gov for the county. Um, we know that uh, 173 organizations have uh, started to volunteer. And there was a press release earlier today to talk about those organizations who have stepped up um, and, and supported uh, this community. We know that CMS has um, continued to provide uh, school lunches and have provided over 500,000 school lunches. Uh, since um, schools have been closed. I mean, that is that is huge. We know that Elevation Church um, has given out uh, various uh, kits, um, uh, sanitation kits for individuals. We know that various other churches have stepped up. We know that our Black pastors have stepped up and, and really have increased our communication to those seniors um, that don't get on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube they just want a phone call and they just want to hear from somebody. And we know that our churches have continued to do that. So there's definitely good news that people are being healed. Um, there's good news of uh, small business loans. There's good news of additional social services. Um, so there, I, I think there's some, some good things. And I think families are talking to one another now because they're getting tired of looking at um, social media. Right. 
You can only do so much Netflix and Disney Plus. I mean, come on. <laughs> right. How many right, times right. y'all gonna watch that Trolls movie? I mean, come on now. <laughs> right. Right. I'm, I'm enough already. But, you right. know, I mean, I, I think people take, you know, have to make to find some joy in all of this. And, you know, maybe this is God's way um, of, of a giant reset for many of us. But we can't lose sight of the fact that 20,000 people in, in the U.S. have more than 20,000 people in the U.S. have lost their lives and families have been affected. Um, and we now lead the world. We lead the world. And I don't and we'll unfortunately be in a position where we'll always lead the world going forward. I think just in the sheer numbers, but it is, it's such an, it's such an encouraging thing to know that it's just not all about the ticker tape that we're seeing every night. If you're even watching it um, of what the numbers are and because we have to be aware of it. I mean, cause we have to take this seriously, but to know that people are, are recovering and, and people are making it through this um, and are being blessed, you know, to be able to, to have a chance to be able to share their story. Um, what other good news? You getting some sleep? A little bit. <laughs> That's no, good news. I, I I am getting some some sleep, and uh, what's good to me is that my family is 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 healthy, um, mm -hmm. and you know I'm able to get on shows like uh, yours, Little Cousins Show, <laughs> um, smile and laugh and and be healthy. Um, that that's good news. Um, but you know when people just reach out and you know, call me or text me and just check on me. I mean, I think, you know, people, you know, we live in a, in a real giving, caring community and country. And those, those, those caring um, small deeds are really showing. So I'm happy uh, for that. What would you say? And without any profanity, <laughs> what would you say to someone who still refuses to accept that we have to do something and that it's, it's a personal responsibility, but it's also responsibility for the people we come in contact with. And I, I'll give you an example. I had a conversation today with someone who I thought was pretty intelligent, thought so, but we got yeah. to talking about this and he said, <laughs> he said, well, that's not my president and I'm not gonna follow the rules. I said, what do you mean? You're not gonna follow the rules. like." What do you mean? Because I was like, okay, don't freak out, Yolanda. Like, maybe this is just, you know, may, I, I don't want to misunderstand. But legit was like, I'm not doing any of that. I'm not social distancing. This isn't real. And when as far as to say, and this is what I found disturbing, but also realize that this is a mindset that a lot of people have. Had a family member that passed away from an, an uncle, but instead of that even being a wake up call, it was like, well, you know, he shouldn't be <laughs> literally it was like, well, he shouldn't have been eating meat. It was that meat that killed him. What? Like vegetarians mm -hmm. aren't getting this. Like, what is that? Mm -hmm. So what would you say, real talk to someone mm -hmm. or how would you even broach the subject with our with your own friends, family members who still have this mindset that this isn't real and that it's not going to affect them? And who cares? Like, what would you say to that person? Well, when you just said 20,000 people have died. I mean, those are those are real people and you have to, you know, really uh, break it down to, you know, uh, the risk uh, that they're taking uh, that potentially could take somebody else's life. And it's not just about them because they could be a, a, a symptomatic. And, um, you know, if you care about other people, um, that you will actually take some personal responsibility and um, really adhere to the direction that we're giving folks. Because, I mean, again, as I said earlier, the CDC person said 80% of this country potentially will have it. Uh, we should assume that everybody has it and just care about somebody else. If you don't care about yourself, care about me, you know, as, 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 as your friend. And, and, you know, it's so much information and so many facts that are out there and the media has just really been uh, pushing um, social distancing and the risk associated with this and to see people cry. Um, if you don't have any compassion there, um, I would say um, uh, Atrium has a behavioral health line. Um, Cardinal has a behavioral health line. And we have a mobile crisis center that has a line. And, you know, maybe um, call, call one of these lines and try to, you know, see see what's going on with 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 
you know, that individual. So last couple of questions, um, and somebody had actually had submitted this before the show, and I believe Governor Cooper has already addressed this as to why is it that the ABC stores are considered essential in this day and age? I know the answer, but what's the answer? Well, you know, some of them provide food and- Not and, the ABC um, store. Every- right? <laughs> <laughs> you tried it though. <laughs> Not that store. <laughs> you know, I, I, I trust our governor uh, knows what's best for our, our state. No, <laughs> no, that's real talk. And he answered that. It's like, you know, we have to be realistic. I mean, there's if we close the ABC stores, you know, we're flooding hospitals um, yeah. with people going through alcohol withdrawal. And you got I mean, and I, I respect that. I mean, you have to understand the lesser of two evils at this point. Um, yeah. and you have to figure out what's that, what's that risk assessment as far as that's concerned. I mean, we all joked about, um, yeah, you got to have that yet. <laughs> Why are you trying to get through this? But, yeah. at, but no real talk. I mean, that, that's very, very important. You mentioned a, mo- a mobile crisis center. And I think a lot of people don't know that we have that. Um, uh, and I think we're going to have to have some real, if we can have you back. Cause I don't, um, cause this is, this is obviously the first of many conversations as we kind of mm-hmm. like wade through this, because one of the things we're going to have to deal with later are people who are struggling with depression, who've never had it before. People are struggling, um, with anxiety who've never had it before because we're in a whole new world. So, you know, what do you say to someone um, or what what options are out there um, that they may be able to talk to someone or perhaps seek an evaluation if they're feeling, you know, high levels of anxiety or maybe dealing with or struggling with depression, what options are for them are out there for them here in Mecklenburg County? Well, I think we have a, a, a lot of options. I don't, hopefully people are taking advantage of them. Um, Cardinal has a 24 hour um, crisis hotline and that number is 800-939-5911. Atrium has a behavioral health helpline and that number is 704-444-2400. And then we have a mobile uh, crisis uh, team and that number is 704 Five six six three four one zero. And again, I'll share these numbers with you. Okay. Um, so there is definitely resources available. Um, you're definitely concerned about those resources being um, stretched. Um, you know, because this is causing a lot of trauma uh, to the brain uh, when you can't do something that you were able to do before. Um, it really does um, stress people out. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if a person's love language was um, physical touch um, and you can't reach out and touch someone, um, you know, that's that's a real that's a real problem and it can cause some real stress. So mm-hmm. we, we recognize that. And for me, I'm, I have staff that are still in the community doing work in our YFS area and our services for adults area. And they're still going out um, taking calls of child abuse and neglect or adult abuse and neglect. Um, And they're going into homes and investigating situations. And domestic violence is another area that we are very concerned about. And specifically, uh, you know, one of the saddest stories that, you know, I've I've ever experienced, one of our colleagues um, in the county manager's office was murdered last week. Um, wow. by her um, husband, who she had a protection order out. And he came and murdered her and her child, their child. Oh and then so, um, you know, trauma to the brain and the stress associated with, you know, this and other um, issues is real. And we want people to get the help that they need. So... I can go on and on and on. Um, and that's why I love you, um, <laughs> because this is, it's just so important to get this information out. Here. I'm going to repeat um, for, for those of you that um, just tuned in or are tuning in later, the options as far as if um, you're dealing with um, a potential mental health issue or someone that you know, and there's no shame in making that call because 
for a lot of people, you know, you may be experiencing real depression for the first time or real anxiety for the first time, because this is something that's new for all of us. Um, it's funny because you said like your love language, like if your love language is physical touch, mine is quality time. You know, I'm about to lose it. Right. There's only but so many FaceTime calls you can make and right. virtual happy hours. Oh, God. Oh, and I can't get on a plane. Child. Anyway. But but <laughs> it's hard. And, you know, in, in all transparency for me, I know there was at least a few days where I just did not understand what I was feeling. And it just knocked me off my socks because it was just like, what is this? You know, and I, I, I don't know if that's what it was. I had to, you know, go into prayer and a lot of meditation, a lot more prayer and just had to kind of find myself again. But there is no shame in admitting and seeking help if you feel like you need help. So there's a, the Mech, the Mecklenburg County. Is it Mecklenburg County Mobile Crisis Center? I want to make sure I say yeah, it correctly. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. so that number is 704-566-3410. Um, Cardinal has a 24-hour crisis center. That's 1-800-939-5911. And Atrium Behavioral Health, their number is 704-444-2400. I'll be posting this in the comments, and I'm going to do a longer, uh, quick blog post as well. So for those of you watching, you can share that information. But like I said, you know, despite all of that, despite the what we're dealing with in Mecklenburg County, um, in the bigger picture, it, you know, it, with all of the changes that people are feeling and dealing with the, the beautiful part um, in some respects, because you have to be able to see the positive in this is that, you know, in terms of people having time together, um, people finding unique ways to still connect when you don't have the physical ability to connect, um, what were people finding and using social media in a way that's positive to connect um, and just people having to reinvent themselves in a way that's positive as well. And the fact of the matter is, as bad as the numbers are, people are surviving um, and we have to celebrate that, you know, in the goodness of his mercy in terms of people being able to get their lives back. Um, but we also can't be dismissive of people who have lost their lives and how that has a greater impact on their families. So, you know, we hug, hug your friends from a distance, hug your family from a distance. Um, make sure you're wearing your mask. Uh, one other quick question. If a person doesn't have a, a actual medical mask, they can make their own mask. Um, That's correct. There's plenty of YouTube um, examples out there. People are selling masks out there. So there's plenty of ways that you can get them. If you can't get a medical one, please sanitize it properly. No, you can't put a cloth mask in the microwave. You're going to burn your fabric and then you're going to be breathing all those chemicals. Don't do that. Hot right. soap and water <laughs> and detergent, like wash it. Um, same with medical masks. You can't be reusing them all the time. Anything else? Little tidbits that we, oh, and the whole gloves thing. My goodness. Don't put the gloves and then touch everything and then be trifling and leave your gloves on the ground or end up touching your face anyway, you just spreading it all over the place. Am I missing something? Anything else we need to not be doing? Good. That was good. <laughs> okay, all of those good things. So for those of you who tuned in, um, uh, your mama was here, your yeah. sister was here, looks like your brother-in-law was here, Elizabeth's here, she, she posted the Hope for NC Helpline as well, which is 855-587-3463. Thank you for that, we're gonna post that. I'm going to post Trinavia's study that she did. Um, Elizabeth also indicated the Michael Jordan Clinic on 9149 Freedom Drive is opening as an ass assessment center starting on Wednesday. Um, Wednesday during the week. I'm not sure if I'm reading that right from eight to five. Um, but for those of you um, who have tuned in, thank you, of course. Um, now, obviously, no, you can't reach out to him directly. Leave him alone. He trying to get a nap every yeah. now and then. But no, in all seriousness, um, you know, I, I truly want to thank you for all of your hard work, because since you've been here, you really have made a tremendous impact in ways that you, you really, truly do not know. And the fact that having probably one of the most people centered areas that you supervise in a way it requires a level of understanding and empathy and organization and all of those things, but just being able to deal with people and you do that so well. And that's not, not me just saying that from Trotman to Trotman or that your cousin, I mean that sincerely because yeah. I hear that all the time from people who ask me if we're related or ask me if I know you because 
this type of work that you do specifically impacts the lives of everyday people and you don't they, you don't take that lightly. And so I truly appreciate you for that. So thank you for the wonderful wealth of information. If you haven't done so already, shameless plug, make sure that you are liking, following and subscribing to everything all social media at the Convo Pod Show. Um, and this actually showed up on the YouTube channel tonight. Thank goodness. So all of our future live shows will also be showing up on YouTube if you're not connected to us through the Facebook page. So definitely we will have, you got to come back. And next time right. we can we can have a drink <laughs> and talk about <laughs> other stuff. Um, but it has been a real joy, seriously. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and giving us so much wonderful information and just being just being real with us because we don't oft oftentimes get the opportunity to see people who have the type of, of work schedule and and responsibilities that you do, just be yourself and to be able to have an open and honest conversation. So I appreciate you, truly. Well, I appreciate you too. All um, right, so virtual hugs and stuff. <sighs> I miss you. <laughs> all right, y'all, so um, tune in in a little bit. I'm gonna post all this information as far as the numbers, as far as the mobile testing. Um, as far as where you can gather more information, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you again um, for joining us on the conversation. Like I told y'all, don't nobody gets to call him big cuz other than me. I said that <laughs> again, and I mean that. Don't make me come looking for you. Join us <laughs> next time on the conversation again. Follow us on all things social media at the Convo Pod Show. Good night, y'all. Good night. <laughs>